Good morning, family. Pastor Khalil Rogers here, senior pastor of the Pinal Baptist Church, located in the heart of North Philadelphia on 25th and Jefferson. Thank you so much for tuning in to our um, live stream uh, sermon this morning uh, at the Pinal Baptist Church. Pray that you guys are being blessed by uh, the content and the word that is going forth every week. I pray and trust um, and God that you and your families are healthy. I trust that you are well. I trust that you are kept in perfect peace as your mind is stayed on Christ. And <clears throat> I also pray that you are holding um, close to Christ, that you are being steadfast and immovable, that your faith, even though it may be shaken at times because all of us um, all of our faith is shaken and tested at times, but I pray that your faith is not depleted and I pray that you are being strengthened. I pray that you are being fortified and renewed daily as you stay close to Christ and stay close to his word. Um, meet me in <clears throat> the gospel according to Matthew chapter 8 beginning at verse 1. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. And I'm reading from uh, the New King James today. I want to read from New King James. The text reads, And when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. That's the word of the Lord. It is already blessed. I want to use as a thought today, God is willing and able. God is willing and able. Father, move me out of your way. Hide me behind the cross where Jesus is the center of all attraction. And make me a humble waiter to serve up your bread to your people. Continue to strengthen. Continue to heal. Continue to deliver. Continue to set free. I pray, God, that someone watching this today will be encouraged. I pray that someone watching this today who may be in a pit of desperation and despair, like this leper in the text was, I pray, God, that they would know that you are willing and able. Be with all of us, God, as we draw closer to you. And I definitely pray if someone is watching, if they don't have a relationship with Christ, that they would meet the man from Galilee today, named Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. For us in Jesus' name, we do pray with love and thanksgiving. Amen. God is willing and able. There is no argument among scholars that Jesus' most famous sermon is the Sermon on the Mount. Starting in Matthew chapter 5 and ending in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus teaches us eight crucial lessons about kingdom life. And as he closes the sermon, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 39, he spoke about life, faith, and the dangers of not following his teachings. And it is in our text today that Jesus comes down from the mountain and is approached by a leper. And in this passage, uh, there are two very bold moves that jump off the page. The first bold action was made by the leper who approached Jesus begging for healing. 
This action by the leper was bold because in the time of Jesus, lepers were not only considered unclean, but untouchable. Anything they touched was burned, and any people they touched became tainted and had to separate themselves from the community until they were purified. Because lepers were untouchable, they lived in quarantined and lived in separate communities where they had to socially distance themselves. Whenever they came around people, they had to yell out unclean so that people could social distance themselves away from the leper. If lepers were spotted, people often threw stones at them to make sure that they would keep their distance as in to say, stay away from me, you deplorable, you untouchable, you unclean. Because both the origin and the cure of leprosy were unknown. And because it was believed to be contagious, this skin dissolving and bone consuming disease known as leprosy, was the most repugnant, the most dreaded, and the most feared disease in ancient times. Living in a COVID-19 world, we can understand a little bit what that's like. And when the leper ventured out in public to find and approach Jesus, he was making a bold move. Where did he get this boldness? Perhaps it was a boldness born out of desperation that can make one daring. If you get desperate enough, you will do some things you wouldn't ordinarily do. Be careful saying what you will never do. You never know how desperate circumstances of life will make you. Uh, sometimes when you're in a desperate situation, you will do some things that you would not ordinarily do do. Some people who never thought about committing a crime commit crimes out of desperation. Some people who would never think about leaving their spouse leave their spouse out of desperation. Some, some people who, who never thought that they would behave violently or erratic in some circumstance respond that way out of desperation. Be careful saying what you won't do. You, you never know what life will throw at you. And you never know what it will be like unless you're in a moment of complete desperation. This leper understood what that was like, even to the point to risk his own life and his own safety to venture out in public to meet Jesus. Leprosy, similar to the coronavirus, is the kind of illness that will drive a person to desperation. Not only because of what it does to a person externally, but also internally. Leprosy ate away at your limbs and made a person loathsome to look at. And that's bad enough. But can you imagine living with the loneliness and isolation that this disease brings as people withdraw from you and treat you worse than they do a stray dog. That's enough to kill your spirit. You, 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 and, and you weren't only quarantined for 14 days. <laughs> if you were a leper, you were quarantined pretty much for life. And I believe just about any physical disease can be managed if the person's spirit is alive and fighting. But when the spirit the self-worth and the self-esteem of a person is undermined and attacked and there is no human comfort, no compassion, and no understanding except from fellow sufferers who are living with their own pain and problems and there is no escape but death, then one begins to get an idea of what hell may be like. When, when, when we look at how lepers were tortured in body by the disease and then tortured in spirit and soul by the ignorance, rejection, and persecution from other people, we can understand why they were called the walking dead. Ah, but there is 
hope for those who may be in despair. There is hope for those who may be in a, a, a circumstance and may be in utter desperation. There is hope for those who may be wondering if there is a God who is willing and able to change my situation. And it's right here in the text. And that's why I dropped by just to share some jewels from the text today to remind you that he is willing and he is able. The first thing we notice in our text family is we notice the attraction of Christ. We notice the attraction of Christ. Verse one says, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes or crowds followed him. Uh, the teachings of Jesus were so radical. They were so extreme and, and they had a drawing power and great multitudes, great crowds followed him. Because truth is self-verifying and, and though people may not like it, they'll never forget it. The text says that when he had come down, see, 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 as I tell my church all the time, it's important that when you read the Bible, you, you, you have to read it slowly because if you read it too quickly, you, you're going to skip over something. If you read it too fast, uh, just to try to get it over with, you're going to skip over critical pieces of information. You, you got to read the Bible slow because there's some powerful uh, principles in that phrase when he had come down. To, to, to come down uh, in the original language or, uh, or to go down means to descend from a higher place to a lower place. He, he, he came down from the mountain to come see about some folks in the valley. Ah, uh, I feel like preaching now. He, he came down from heaven to, to see about some folks in the heart of the hood. He, he came down from paradise to see about some folks here in Philly. He came down from his heavenly kingdom to see about some folks on Kensington Avenue. He came down from the celestial city to see about some folks in Center City. He came down from the abode of God to see about some folks who were absent from God. He came down from the abode of the saints to save a world of sinners. Ah. And the text says that the multitudes the multitudes. This is a large, confused crowd. And in, in, in the original language, it, it really is an unorganized mob. These, these aren't disciples of Christ because the text would have clearly told us that. And it is evident from the gospel accounts that God sees a difference between the disciples and the crowds. <laughs> Uh, I'm not making it up. I'm going to give you some Bible. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32 says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Then Jesus said, uh, Jesus spake unto the multitude and to his disciples. Matthew 23, 1. Um, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 14 says, And when he came down to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them. Ah, that ain't enough for you. Luke 6, 17. And, and, and he, being Jesus, came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and saw a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem. Ah, that's not enough. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Naim, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Ah, still not enough. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all. So, so we clearly see from the gospel accounts uh, that Jesus or the Bible makes a dif different differentiation between the crowds and disciples. Now, the, the, the crowd represents an unorganized mob. The, the, the crowd uh, represents people who are like uh, sheep without 
a shepherd. Uh, uh, the crowd is is folk who who ain't got it all together, and and the crowd uh represents church folk. Uh, uh, see, there is a difference between church folk and disciples. It, it, it's important for us to know um, that there is a difference and that real church growth is a measure of the growth of the individual believer and not necessarily the size of the congregation. <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that, that, that is a benefit for us right now, being in this lockdown, is that the size of the church don't matter much right now um, because we can't see y'all anyway. Uh, so, so, so the size of the church don't, 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 don't much matter right now. And God is teaching us that. See, we, we can't no longer put um, an overemphasis on the size of the church. Um, or, or put more of an emphasis on that than we do the, the spiritual growth and stature of the believers who are a part of that church. See, see, God would much rather have a church with 50 sold out disciples of Jesus Christ rather than a church with 5,000 carnal spectators. Uh, see, see, the multitudes were fickle people. That they were only interested in what God could do for them, but never interested in committing themselves to him. Let me help you out. John the Baptist had a huge following. And, and even the Pharisees came out in great numbers to watch this wild prophet preach. But his numbers eventually dwindled. Judas had a large following, a band of men that went with him to arrest Jesus. In the Greek, that band was anywhere from uh, 500 to 1,000 men. But we know how, how that ended. Peter had a huge following on the day of Pentecost. He saw 3,000 get saved and then 5,000 more a short time later, which is a mega church of 8,000 folks. But when Herod took James and beheaded him, the church did nothing. That They prayed for Peter when he was locked up during a prayer meeting in John Mark's mother's house when God broke Peter out of jail. And I don't know how big her house was. But I'm sure it couldn't hold 8,000 folks. Where were the rest of the church? Where, where was the rest of the believers? Where was the multitudes when Peter needed their help that they weren't at prayer meeting because church folks don't usually come to Bible study and, and, and prayer meeting. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing. Jesus, Jesus drew the multitudes away from John and they followed him everywhere he went. And these multitudes came to Jesus to hear and be healed and to be fed a free meal. And as long as they got their needs met, as long as they got their touch from God, they were okay. Where was this mega church? Where was this crowd when Jesus was carried to his cross? Where, where was the mega congregation at Calvary? See, see the, the crowds, church folks, they're fickle. But the crowds are also astonished at good doctrine. They, they, they just don't want to live good doctrine. We, we see that in Matthew 22, uh, 33. See, church folks don't really mind being taught. But problems arise when you try to get them to act on what they heard. Remember, I'm not talking about disciples. I'm talking about church folks. We see that in Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 13. Um, church folks love feel good sermons a lot, a lot like the crowds, but, but, but can't really handle deep teaching that that's why Jesus taught the crowds, uh, with parables and then expounded the deeper truths in private to his disciples. See church folk want to hear a good sermon. I just hope pastor preach a good sermon. I, I, I just want to hear a good sermon, but, but they really don't want to hear a sermon that does some good. G Jesus looked over the crowds, looked over the multitudes, looked at the church folk and as he ministered to them and had compassion toward them because they were like sheep having no shepherd. See, the multitudes often come to see what they can get, but, but, but not what they can give. 
They, they love to hear the sermon and have hands laid on them. According to Luke 5, 15, they love to eat, but they, but they, they ain't sticking around after that to help, help clean up nothing. See, Christ loves multitudes. He loves the church folks, but, but that's not what he's looking for. See, he's not looking for crowds. He's not looking for church folk. He's looking for disciples. And this COVID lockdown has helped us really understand the difference. See, see, right now we can't play church. Right now we can't we can't play church, but we can do kingdom work. <laughs> we can do kingdom work. We can do what we was really supposed to do in the first place because uh, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to uh, play church. It tells us to make disciples. Uh, Jesus, Jesus tells us to make disciples because the kingdom can't be enhanced with confused, carnal, comfortable, complacent, and complaining church folks. Not only do we see the attraction of Christ, but we also see the authority of Christ. It's right there in verse 2. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Immediately after Jesus finished teaching, on the mountain, he encounters a leper. This is a disease that does not discriminate. It affects both men and women. And the man in the text is nameless, which means he could be any of us. He's identified not by name, but by his condition. He's identified by his sickness. Uh, 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 I, I work in the pharma industry. I, I work um, um, helping uh, put, put things together, help put contracts together for clinical trials. And one of the things that they do, they never refer to the person in the trial by their name. They refer to them as subject number such and such. And sometimes they refer to them by their disease. Can, can you imagine the dehumanization? That this brother is feeling see see leprosy is associated with sin now nowhere in the bible does it ever say that leprosy is a sin doesn't say that however biblical expositors generally regard leprosy as an illustration for sin Leviticus 13 is devoted to a lengthy diagnosis of leprosy. It, its pollution and uncleanliness is associated with the disease and the defilement of sin. In Leviticus 14, it deals with the recovery from leprosy, which is never called healing, but cleansing, a term which suggests the removal of sin. Leprosy was often considered divine punishment for personal sin, as in the cases of Miriam, Gehazi, and Uzziah. But leprosy is slow and insidious. Uh, it, it starts out with one little spot on the shoulder or on the arm, but the disease begins to work insidiously within and, and time would spread gradually, but surely marring and scarring the beautiful body God has given us. Like leprosy sin, it operates the same way. It, it, it begins in a small way and spreads insidiously, infecting all of our faculties, twisting our intellect, perverting our emotions, hardening our conscience and enslaving our will. Coveting leads to stealing. A little flirtation leads to adultery. A little anger grows into rage, which can lead to murder. They won't miss me, said a church member sleeping in on one Sunday morning when he when we were able to go to our buildings. And, and, and then a month later, he missed another church service, then more frequently till he was no longer attending. The leprosy is also insensitive. It's insensitive. Sometimes the advance of leprosy attacks the nerve centers, causing the affected area to lose all sensation, suffering no pain when pain should be present. The victim has no warning of the dangerous situation. He, he or she burns his hand severely without feeling a thing. 
It is recorded that a hospital in India for leprosy patients and the patient quarters consisted of mud huts back in the day. And, and before new buildings were established, rats would come out of the walls at night and chew off of the toes of the sleeping leprosy patients who had no sensation, no feeling in any of their members. A lot like sin, it, it paralyzes and removes sensitivity to sin in its various forms. It, it becomes easy for the sinner to lie, cheat, steal, gossip, hate, and even murder without a single feeling of guilt. Leprosy, it, it's infectious. It, it is often caught from the parents. In most cases occur in childhood, usually before the age of 15, apparently from long and frequent contact with affected parents. This makes it crucial to separate babies from parents who have leprosy, have to social distance themselves. Though leprosy is not inherited, our sinful nature is. Because we are descendants of Adam, every child um, that's born into this world is born with a sinful nature, which will soon express itself in sinful thoughts, words, and actions. Every child is contaminated with the disease of sin passed on from our original parents. Paul wrote by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Romans chapter five, verse 19. My pastor says it this way. We all come from the sin factory with factory defects. Leprosy is also isolating. At the time of Jesus, a leper could not enter the temple or walk into Jerusalem or any walled city without suffering the penalty of 40 stripes. In the village synagogue, a leper had to be first to come out and last to leave. And where there, um, and while they were there, he or she was confined to an isolated chamber. They had to social distance themselves. The victim could never go home nor engage in any business, but had to live off of scraps. The leprosy is incurable, like coronavirus. There was no common cure for leprosy, and like sin. It starts small and works silently and slowly until it separates, destroys, and ultimately causes death. Which is why Jesus Christ had to shed his blood at Calvary. Because without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. And that's what I tell folk who don't uh, believe in Jesus Christ when I'm having conversations with them. Um, maybe about their faith or, or just about their life. And they take, say things like, well, all things or all roads lead to God. I say, you're absolutely right. All roads lead to God because all of us are eventually going to meet God one day. All of us are going to have to stand before him one day to be judged. But the question I have for you, if you don't have Christ, how are you going to stand in judgment? What, what, what you going to do about your sin? <laughs> what, what you going to do about sin? See, only Christ can remove sin. Only he can atone for sin at Calvary. And if you don't receive him, how are you going to stand in judgment? Still waiting for an answer for that question. Um, but leprosy is also universal. Leprosy is found in most countries of the world. I told you that leprosy does not discriminate. It knows no bounds geographically, socially, racially, or culturally. And though relatively few in the world are lepers, Every person born into this world, except for Jesus Christ, is born a sinner. Sin knows no national bounds. Sinners abound in every nation, race, color, culture, and creed under the sun. Every last one of us is a moral leper in need of divine cleansing. In leprosy, victims are treated as dead. It, it was better to be dead than be a leper back then. A victim's isolation proclaimed them a living corpse to be shunned by healthy people. Leprosy was a living death. Jewish historian Josephus declared that lepers were treated as if they were, in fact, dead men. Sometimes in the Middle Ages, when a person learned that they were a leper, the priest, in gown and with a crucifix, led the person into the church and read the burial service over the person as if they had already died. Paul clearly states that those who have not yet trusted Christ as Savior are dead in sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. Which is why humanity stands in need of a Savior. Humanity stands in need 
of Jesus Christ. I don't care what the issue is. Jesus is the answer for the world today. I will preach that. I will believe it until the day I die. Jesus is the answer for the world today. This leper understood that. He came and he worshipped Jesus. Worship is, is to show respect. It's to show homage. It's to prostrate before someone. This, this, this happens when one person understands that they are much inferior in stature and status to another person. So that inferior person falls down upon their knees and touches the ground with their forehead and sometimes kisses at the superior individual. This, 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 this is how they paid homage and reverence in ancient Israel and Palestine. Uh, uh, many of you, some of my, my family members and, and, and some of my friends are, are, are Muslim um, or of the Islamic tradition. And our Islamic brothers and sisters, one of the things that, that you will notice, those of them who, who practice their faith, uh, you'll see sometimes a, a Muslim man has a mark on his forehead uh, from, from allowing his head to touch the ground in homage to God in prayer. Uh, it's called a prostration mark. Um, the, the bigger the pro prostration mark uh, shows that this is a man who is committed to his faith, who is committed to God because he is a man of prayer. He is a man who prostrates himself before God, a man who worships God. That, that's what this word is in the text in, in terms of worship. That's what it means uh, is to fall down on your knee and allow your head to touch the ground before God. Now. What does that have to do with us? What it means for us is if you want to get God's attention, you got to get your mind off yourself and you got to get it on him. Let me say that again. If you want to get God's attention, you got to get it off of you and get it on him. Um, as we worship God, and I mean truly worship him, not just lifting up our hands, but lifting our hearts. God hears us. This leper knelt before Jesus with a desperate appeal for him. Remember, lepers were untouchable. They lived in separate communities and, and whenever they, they came around, they had to yell out unclean so that the individuals in the immediate area could social distance themselves and flee from their presence. Imagine, imagine if in our society today, we had to yell out all of our issues for the entire community to hear. You know that thing you do that you hide so well? Because you don't want nobody else to know about it. Because of the shame that comes with it. Uh, you got a thing, I got a thing. All God's children got a thing. That you don't want somebody else to know. Stop, stop, stop acting cute. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Um, can, can you imagine being forced to put your business out in the street? For all of us to judge you. That, 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 that's, that's what the lepers had to do. That, that's why we should be careful not to condemn People Now, uh, don't, don't believe that only God can judge me. I don't know where we get that from. That ain't Bible, by the way. That's Tupac. Tupac said that. That's not biblical. Uh, people will judge you. Other people will judge you. In fact, um, we should. We should judge uh, in, in terms of holding each other accountable. That's a judgment, too. But we shouldn't condemn other people. That, that We have no right to condemn other people. Only God can do that. So in that regard, we shouldn't judge people because... Like this leper, their issue may be public, but ours is private. But you and I, we got our stuff too. We, we just know how to dress our mess up with fancy clothes. We just know how to mask our mess with, with churchy lingo. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, bless his name. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. And all this other foolishness that we say that ain't biblical, by the way. We, we know how to hide it. We know how to hide it. <laughs> Especially now because can't nobody see us But even when we were in our buildings Even when we were coming to church Many of us were just playing church We know how to dress it up And we knew how to hide it on Sunday morning We knew how to hide it during Wednesday night Bible study We knew how to cover it up in our church meetings We, we learned how to send our representatives out into the world but, but, but the real us is who we are When we believe no one is looking When we believe no one is watching that, That's who the real you is that's who the real you, that's who you are. I know that's not good grammar, but it's good theology. That's who the real you is. When, when, when nobody else is watching, or when you think nobody else is watching, because God is always watching, but when you think nobody else sees you, 
How are you? That's the real you. Not the person you sent out to the job. Not the person that comes to church. Not the person who comes out and ventures out in public. That's the representative. Who is the real you? Who are you after we say amen? Who are you when the sermon is over? Who are you when you punch out at the job? The real you is who you are when you think no one is watching. But 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 what what happened to us? If like this leper in the text, <laughs> our stuff got out. The, the leper had no other recourse but to come to Jesus. Because when your situation is desperate and you have no other options, and you have exhausted all of your resources, you have no choice but to call on Jesus. That, that's why many of us um, did not look up to Christ or did not receive Christ until we hit rock bottom. You, you know the good thing about hitting rock bottom? You can't get no lower. There's only one way to go from there. Once you hit the bottom, you can only go up from there. And sometimes Christ has to allow us to hit the bottom, has to allow us to fall flat on our face so that we can look up. And, and maybe that's why God isn't taking that problem away from you. Because he knows the day that he takes it from you, you're going to forget about him. Maybe God is not removing that issue because he knows that the issue is the only thing keeping you close to him. If we had it all together, if we had it all figured out, I wonder would we be as committed uh, to Christ as we are now? Ah, folk, folk, folk. Folk in the middle of this pandemic, they 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 wanted to know, oh, well, can we do online Bible studies? Can we can we can we have more um, 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 sermons and, and 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 more meetings with people and and getting together? I wonder why, because we're in the middle of some uh, desperate situation. So now people, uh, their God conscious is is wide open. But but, but prior to this, we, you know, people did their own thing. Want uh, I, I, I want to get in and want to get out so I can go do my own thing. Would we be as committed to Christ if, if, if everything was okay? If the marriage was perfect? If the kids are getting good grades? When the job, get your promotion. If you still got a job, because many people are out of work right now. If the car is running well. If the house isn't falling apart. If families and friends are treating you right. If uh, people in your ministry aren't working your last nerves. If racism, violence, COVID-19 and Trump weren't bombarding our news feeds, would we pray as much as we do? Would we study our word as much as we do? Would we participate in ministry like we do? See, there, there's some obedience. There is some obedience that only comes through suffering. There is some obedience that only comes through suffering. This leper had faith that the Lord could cure him. And true faith is never disappointed. True faith is never disappointed. He calls Jesus Lord. Lord here is uh, the word kurios. It, it, it means might, power, master, or owner. It has to do with giving authority to someone. He says, if you are willing, if you were willing, you can make me clean. If you were willing, um, uh, Willing is to desire. If, if you have a desire to, it, it implies an act or volition and purpose. Lord, if you were willing, if you are willing, I, I know that you can do it for me. Uh, if I could use my theological imagination, I can hear him saying, Lord, nobody has touched me in a long time. No, nobody has hugged me in a long time. I, I've been estranged from my family. I've been thrown out of the community. I've been put away into the wilderness where nobody will come in contact with me. I haven't had my children jump up on my knee and kiss me on the cheek in a long time. I haven't felt the warm embrace of my wife in a long time. Lord, I'm an undocumented immigrant and this administration doesn't care for me. I'm an essential worker who's overworked and underpaid and have to go and risk my life to work every 
day. I'm, I'm, I'm a young black woman that nobody wants to get equal pay. I'm a young black man with tattoos all over my body. And, and so when folks look at me, they automatically assume I'm a criminal before even getting to know me. I'm a victim of human trafficking and nobody cares about me. I'm mentally ill in this country I live in. Doesn't take my condition seriously. I'm developmentally delayed, physically disabled, and deeply in despair. I've been in and out of jail. And now that I'm out, nobody wants to give me a job. I can't even vote. I'm from a low socioeconomic status. I grew up on welfare to a poor single black mother and folks have counted me out. I'm a single black mother who had a baby out of wedlock and people automatically judge me based on how I dress and I can't afford nice clothes because all my benefits that I receive that come from the government, they go to take care of me and my child. Lord, I'm somebody who's confused about my gender identity and I can't even talk to nobody about it because I come from a religious conservative family and I'm afraid they may judge me and tell me I'm going to hell. But Lord, I heard a testimony from somebody else that you delivered and that's why all of these crowds of confused people are following you and they say it's no secret what God can do, what God has done for others. He can do the same for you. So Lord, I know you're able. I, I, I know you're able to heal me. I know you're able to cleanse me. I've seen it. I've seen you deliver people from drugs. I've seen you deliver people from poverty. I've seen you deliver people from bad relationships. I've seen you put folks' marriages back together. I've seen you restore people's relationship with their children. I've seen you deliver alcoholics. I've seen you deliver criminals. I've seen you deliver mean-spirited people. I've seen you deliver racist people. I've seen you deliver murderers. I've seen you deliver thieves. I've seen you deliver sex addicts. I've seen you deliver fornicators. I've seen you deliver adulterers. I've seen you deliver folks from jealousy. I've seen you deliver folks from envy. I've seen you deliver folks from hatred. I've seen you deliver self-righteous church folks. I've seen you heal people from coronavirus. Lord, I know you're able. I've seen it. I just want to know if you're willing. Can you make it clean? Clean is pure. It's to be set free from filth. To make it ceremonially clean. It's to purify from the pollution and the guilt, theologically, the guilt and shame of sin. Not only do we see the attraction of Christ in our text, not only do we see the authority of Christ, but we also see the ability of Christ. Verse 3, that Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Remember, the leper makes the first bold move by coming out in public to Jesus. But Jesus makes the second bold move by touching the leper. Physical contact with the leper might expose a person to infection. And in this case of the Jews, uh, this, this contact made the person ceremonially unclean. That is, that they were unfit to worship with the congregation of Israel. But when Jesus touched the leper and spoke words of healing, the leprosy vanished immediately. Touched in the Greek is to make a connection with. It has to do with touching something or someone with the ability to manipulate, modify, or influence. It means that after you've been touched by Jesus, you ain't never the same. <laughs> Once you've been touched by Jesus, you ain't never the same. See, I, I've heard people say, well, you know, you can't, you can't have, you can't meet Jesus or can't have an encounter with Jesus and, and remain the same. Uh, everybody who came in contact with Jesus changed. No, they didn't. Many folks remained the same, but, but nobody who he touched <laughs> was the same. Ah, the text says that immediately, immediately he was cleansed. Immediately, straightway, instantly, forthwith. It means it was done instantly, quickly. Didn't take a long time. There was no treatment regimen. There was no long process. The brother was instantly cured. Jesus is moved with pity. He was not moved with questions about how the brother got his disease. He's not moved with fear that he might get it. He's not moved by the popular prejudice or misunderstanding that told him that he could be defiled if he got too close, because remember, Jesus uh, was a Jew. So he understood uh, Jewish law and Jewish customs in the culture of that day. 
He, he, he's not moved with self-righteous judgment about the leper getting what he deserved the way some of us look down on those people who are different from us as if they're a different species. They're human beings. Others saw a leper. Jesus saw someone in need of love. One preacher says it this way. Others saw a vice. Jesus saw a victim. Others saw uncleanliness. Jesus saw someone in need of understanding. Others saw a hindrance. Jesus saw someone needing help. Others reacted in fear. Jesus reacted with faith. Others saw shame. Jesus saw suffering. Others saw a problem. Jesus saw possibilities. Others would say, cast aside. Jesus said, child of God. Others condemned, but Jesus had compassion. Jesus did not consider this distinction between clean and unclean violence. It wasn't valid in his mind. A, a person's outward condition did not make them unclean to Jesus. Uh, 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 according to Jewish customs, it did, but not according to Jesus. Rather, that which proceeds from the heart determines one's standing before God. Therefore, Jesus did not hesitate about touching lepers and even commanded his disciples to cleanse lepers in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Jesus even made a leper the hero of one of his parables in Luke chapter 16. Our Savior has power to cleanse from sin and, and to qualify the cleansed person to be a worshiper. And maybe that's why some, um, some of us used to come to church but, but didn't worship. We, we, we only came to church. And there's nowhere in the Bible that says we should just come to church. We should be the church. So, so we were in the church building, but the church wasn't in us be, because we, we, we've been damaged by something that's hindering our worship. Well, well there aren't any more distractions now. Um, now. Now you're really free to worship Christ because there are no distractions of playing church anymore uh, in this pandemic. And I want somebody watching to know that Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a healer. And he can remove that thing that's hindering your worship right now. He can remove that thing that's blocking you from being blessed and being all that you can be in Christ. He can remove it right now. When Jesus touched the leper, he was letting him know you have worth. You have value, intrinsic value, and you matter. And I love you. If you know people who have disgraced themselves, we, we, we shouldn't turn our backs on them. Because God didn't turn his back on us. Let's not leave people to suffer by themselves. Because God never leaves us. Reach out and touch the untouchables. And let them know that they are still loved. And that, and that they still have worth. And that God is willing and able. Sometimes they may pull back. But reach out anyhow. Because God never stops reaching out for us. Even when we pull back from him. In this life, there will always be a problem. There will always be trouble, but God delivers. God knew the time of deliverance for Israel. God knows what the time of deliverance is for you too. God is God and his timing is perfect. He delivers just the right people. He delivers just at the right time. He delivers at the right place. He delivers for the right reason and he delivers with the right thoroughness. Not only do we see the attraction of Christ, not only do we see the authority of Christ, not only do we see the ability of, ability of Christ, but lastly, we see the atonement of Christ. Verse four, and Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way and show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus heals the leper and he instructed him to tell no one about being healed but to go show himself to the priest. Now, this was the first of several times Jesus would request secrecy after he performed a miracle. You remember in Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to 21, where Jesus withdrew from the area, uh, but many followed him and he healed all the sick among them. Um, and once again, he warned those healed not to publicize their healing. Christ's restraint reminded Matthew of Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 4, which predicted that the true Messiah would not only battle his enemies, but would quietly do his work as God's servant. 
this quiet ministry would, however, lead to victory. While the leaders of his own people were rejecting him, Christ would fulfill Isaiah's prophecy by extending the gospel to Gentiles as well. So it's not only for Jews. It's not only for black folk. It's not only for white folk. It's not only for rich folk. It's for everybody. Everybody. The gospel is for everybody. Another reason for this secret, look, secrecy, Jesus was aware that many people were only interested in deliverance from Roman oppression and wanted to make him their king. Now, he was king, but not the king that they were looking for. He knew that Israel was still unrepentant and that the nation would reject his leadership and that he must therefore go to Calvary. See, the law required a healed leper to be examined by the priest, according to Leviticus 14. So Jesus wanted this man to give his testimony firsthand to the priest to prove that his leprosy was completely gone so that he could be restored to his community. That's why he says, go and show yourself to the priest. Um, this, the, the parallel accounts of, of Mark and Luke of the story reveal, however, that the leper ignored Christ's directions and freely told others of his healing, as would many others who were instructed not to tell what Jesus did for him. Because when God does something for you, it, it, it's too hard <laughs> to keep it to yourself. There, there are some things that God has done for me and, and, and some things I still haven't said yet. Um, but it's so hard. You, you just want to you just want to share it with someone. But it, it just may not be the right time. But there are a lot of things that I, I didn't want to tell other folk. But I, but I had I just couldn't keep it to myself. You, you didn't want to tell nobody about how he took care of your sickness. But. You just couldn't keep it to yourself. You, you didn't want to tell nobody about how he saved your child from the streets, but you, you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody how he saved you from that abusive relationship, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody how he blessed you with a new job, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody how he brought you out, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody that he delivered you from prostitution, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody that he delivered you from a life of crime and drugs and violence, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. You didn't want to tell nobody that he delivered you from the sin of self-righteousness, but you just couldn't keep it to yourself. Under the law of Moses, the priest also served as a physician. So when a leper was cleansed, he was obligated to bring an offering to appear before the priest in order to be pronounced clean. You find that in Leviticus 14. It was a rare event for a leper to be healed. So extraordinary that it should have alerted this priest to investigate whether the Messiah had definitely did appear. But the text doesn't tell us that. Jesus told the leper to obey the law in this matter. The, the spiritual implications of the miracle are clear. The Messiah had come to Israel with the power to heal the nation of its illness. He presented this miracle as one of his credentials. But the nation was not yet ready for her deliverance. Christ, as our high priest, has already made atonement for our sins. So unlike the Old Testament, we don't have to pay or make an offering for our sins. Christ paid it all at Calvary. Atonement simply means to cover. It means to cover. Um, to cover what? The debt we owe. The debt we owe has been paid in full. It, it, it's like going out with somebody to a restaurant, if you can even go into a restaurant today, and they just, they, they pick up the tag. And you can, you know, you ain't had no money, no way. But, but they took you out and they picked up the tab. They paid it in full. They covered your debt. That, that's all this atoning means. Because, because of Christ's atoning work at Calvary, we are justified, saved from the penalty of sin. We are uh, being sanctified, uh, being saved from the power of sin. And one day we will be glorified, which is to be saved from the very presence of sin. So as I close, never underestimate the miracles that God's people can bring with a touch of faith. We wonder why some saints act the way they do, why some people act the way they do. It's simple. They've been touched. We wonder why some people have so much wisdom and discernment. They've been touched in the head. 
We wonder why some people have so much love and joy. They've been touched in their heart. We wonder why some people have so much peace and patience. They've been touched in the spirit. We wonder why some people have so much fire and so much freedom. They've been touched in their soul. We wonder why some people uh, can, can, can see things that others can't. It's because they've been touched in their vision. We wonder why some people are so useful and productive. They've been touched in their hands. We wonder why some people are so determined and steadfast. They've been touched in their feet. We wonder why some people spread the good news and encouragement wherever they go. They've been touched in their mouths. How do I know that God is real? I've been touched. How do I know that Jesus redeems? I've been touched. How do I know that the Holy Spirit fills? I've been touched. The question for you is, have you been touched? Have you been touched? If you haven't, I just want to let you know that he is willing and he is able. He is willing and he is able to change your situation. And he can do it today. God bless you, family. You may have been watching this and you, like the leper, are in a desperate situation. I don't know what that situation is. I don't know what it is. I'm not even going to try to guess because I don't know who's watching this. But whatever it may be, Jesus has the power. He's willing and he's able to change your situation. If you haven't trusted Christ, the Savior and Lord of your life, I offer you Jesus today. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your race is. Don't care what your ethnicity is. Don't care what your culture is. Don't care what your social status is. I don't care what your sexual identity is. I don't care what your gender assignment is. It doesn't matter. I don't care what your politics are. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, you can receive him today. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Does it mean that everything is going to be all right? No, it does not. In the long, in the grand scheme of things, yes, it does. However, it uh, doesn't mean that instantly everything in your life is just going to be put back together. No, that takes time. It takes work. Um, but I promise you this, you'll never have to go through things alone. You'll never have to experience that feeling of isolation and loneliness. And um, you won't have to go through that stuff, man. You won't have to go through life by yourself. You won't have to go through life by yourself. You won't have to feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. That peace that you've been longing for, that money can't buy. That status and power can't give you. You can't buy peace, man. You can't buy peace of mind. Only true peace, perfect peace can come from him. Knowing that your soul is anchored in Christ is the only true peace on the planet. Because no matter what goes on in this life, listen, man, I don't care what happens. I know I'm good. I know my family is good. That's peace. You can say what you, whatever you want to say about me. Do whatever you want to do to me. I don't care who's going to win the next election. Be nice if we can get this clown out of the White House. But, hey, at the end of the day, if he's going to be president, hey, it is what it is. As long as God is still on the throne, I'm straight. I don't live in fear because I have Christ. So I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to fear nothing standing on two feet. So if you want to receive Jesus Christ, if you want the power of God in your life through the presence of the Holy Spirit, bow with me and I'll introduce, Jesus, introduce you to Jesus right now. Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I need you. Like the leper in the text today, I know that you're willing and I know that you're able and I want you to make me whole. I want you to make me clean. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life, Jesus. I, ex I accept your work at Calvary, your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Save me. Make me whole. I want to be your child. I give you my life today. I give you my heart today. I give you my soul, my spirit, my body. It belongs to you. I relinquish all power and authority over my life, and I give it to you. I want to do your will. I want to do your will, and I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the body of Christ. If you were sincere and you prayed that prayer, welcome to the body of Christ. You are now saved. You are instantly saved.
There ain't nothing that you got to wait for. You automatically have been baptized with the Holy Spirit today, right now. You ain't got to get no water. You know, no, you're saved. So the next step for you is to find a church home as soon as humanly possible where you can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you don't have a church home, if you're in the Philadelphia area, look us up. An Isle Baptist Church, real 25th and Jefferson. Our building is closed right now, but the church is open. The church is open. You can find us online. You can go to our website, uh, www.panalbaptistchurch.org. You can find out everything you need to find out about our church on the website. Uh, you can look at all of the sermons that I've preached throughout the pandemic. They're there on the YouTube channel. They're on Facebook. We're on um, Instagram. Uh, so you look us up on our website, man. You can follow follow all of uh, the, what our church is about, what, some of the things that we're doing in the community. Um, and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Um, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface about what we're going to do. But we need soldiers. We, 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 we ain't looking for church folk. Letting you know that right now. So, so if that's what you, we ain't on that. We're looking for disciples of Christ. We're looking for followers of Christ. So, you, if you want to join the Pinal Baptist Church and you want to be a follower of Christ and submit to His will, and not the traditions of the church necessarily, but to submit to His will, we'll let it have you. We'll let it have you. We'll let it have you. And for those of you who um, um, are continuing to bless us. Um, financially, we thank you so much. Church can't operate uh, electronically or otherwise. <laughs> um, you know, the, the building wouldn't be standing if people weren't um, contributing and, and, and giving in their tithes and donations and, and, and offerings. So we thank you so much. You can continue to give to us. You can um, mail your contributions into the church. You can um, text to give. There's a way to do that online. You can also uh, pay right online. Uh, so you can find all that information out on the website, but I'm Pastor Khalil Rogers. I love all of you. I pray that you're safe. I pray that you and your family are well and that you're being kept in perfect peace. But never forget, family, he is willing and he is able. God bless you and God keep you.